tents which are undeployed uh, is what I'm going to talk about. We know that calcified lesions, and Sudhir has actually I mean, illustrated that beautifully, that calcified tortuous arteries lead to tremendous mace rates, incomplete uh, procedures. And we know from uh, this beautiful paper in early, uh, almost 1998, that uh, rotational arthrectomy definitely impacts these heavily calcified lesions in that it makes, uh, brings about higher success rates resulting in lower revascularizations and MACE rates, which were, the trends were low, though <coughs> could not achieve statistical significance, surely because of the size of the, um, the patient population that was studied. The question we ask is, is are complex procedures risky? And uh, I think the answer comes from the Resolute All Comers study, and uh, it is very clear I'm so sorry about this. Um, yeah, sorry. And the and the answers come to us from uh, the Resolute All Comers study. And when you look at them, when you look at simple lesions as against complex lesions, the white lines are the simple lesions. The yellow lines are the complex lesions. And you can see that death, MI, and revascularization from any any indication is more in those complex lesions. And if you actually uh, pay attention to this slide, you can see that most of these differences happen right in the beginning. And some of that, most of those happen actually in the cat lab. So when you start having, when you start having problems, uh, they, they most often they start right in the cat lab. So the entire basis of this talk is that if you can do something in the cat lab which is simple and make these complex lesions simple, then you could probably take away the separation of the two lines and then you won't have differences between simple lesions and complex lesions in the cat lab. We've had the Rotexas study. Um, this was presented at the TCT 2011. And I think what they did was um, they divided patients into, peop I mean, into patients who received PTCA followed by drug eluting stents and rotablator following, followed by drug eluting stents. What did they ask? Their primary endpoint was instant late loss. In my opinion, they asked the wrong question. Because, as you know, rotational arthrectomy never actually was designed to reduce restenosis, and no trial, we talk about DART, SPORT, the airbag trial, nothing ever showed there's any reduction of TLR. What it showed was successful procedures in people who were failing in those procedures. So it converted suboptimal results into optimal results, incomplete procedures into complete procedures. If I were to design this trial, I would say the primary endpoint is success in completing the procedure and getting optimal stent deployment. And as you can see that there was a marked difference in this success of this strategy in that 92% of patients successfully completed the procedure as against 83. And that is what I'm going to talk about. So, why are these outcomes bad in calcified lesions? And primarily, from what Sudhir showed us, that's why. And stent delivery systems are the biggest problem. You cannot deliver those stents in those complex lesions. Stent expansion is a problem. Undeployed stents is a problem. Damage to polymer and stunt fractures. How does rotational arthrectomy change all that? It modifies the plaque. It helps you successfully complete the PCI by optimally deploying the stent. It reduces procedure time, contrast use and it makes the procedure safe for the patient as well as enhances your life. My indications, these are the two areas where we talk about and this is where we have problems, especially related to undeployed stents. Calcified lesions, failure to cross with the balloon, failure to dilate and undeployed stents. Just a case example, this is one of those patients who is a 65 year old gentleman uh, who had a cabinet with a Lima 2 LAD, vein grafts to RC and OM. The vein grafts were doing well, he continued to have angina with a positive thallium and he had this nasty little LAD lesion just after the anastomosis of the lemur. Um, he's had angioplasties and attempt to angioplasties before and every little device known was tried. All balloons were tried, balloons from 1 millimeter to 1.2 millimeters to 1.25 millimeters and above, all attempted, multiple balloons have been tried. In, in this attempt, we tried to open this, we tried a tornus, we tried every other device, but after putting the wire across, nothing would cross this lesion. Frustration. We put in a, micro, we put in a course there, after all, nudged it into the, the calcified lesion, 
and we managed to get a rotational arthrectomy wire across it. We subsequently did a rotational arthrectomy through the lima into the LAD, successfully ablated or modified the plug. This was post-rotational arthrectomy. We got a decent lesion, and then two stents later, we had a, we had a beautiful looking artery. He continues to do well. There's a little bit of angina, but much better than before with a better effort tolerance. Um, a repeat angiogram was done after a month or, or probably two weeks later for some symptoms, which showed wide patency of these stents. I do not have that angiogram with me at the moment. Um, this is a case from uh, um, Ganesh's lab right here, Madurai. This was Manakshi Mission, a hospital. And this is interesting um, because I was called and uh, they said this patient was taken for an angioplasty at a nasty, heavily calcified lesion right at the ostium of the LAD. And um, Shiva Kumar had actually done this angioplasty and a 2.5 millimeter balloon was, uh, was uh, deployed in this and at 20 atmospheres it wouldn't yield. And that it wouldn't yield um, he chose not to proceed with anything. Uh, they had difficulty getting uh, balloons back into that area. Uh, once the balloon lost its profile, it wouldn't enter the area again. Anyway, we, we, we planned a rotational arthrectomy. This was around two months after the index attempt, uh, 1.25 burr. And you can see that post-deploying, post-burring, you can see there's, a, there's that little wire bias causing little uh, nasty looking appearance, but that's okay, that happens with rotational arthrectomy. The trick is to stop at this point and not go with higher burr sizes, uh, or else you'll start having perforations. And then it was simple to deploy the stent. This is the final result. How do you predict these patients? You predict these patients. This is a, a case of a, a gentleman who had an inferior wall infarction, and we successfully did an, LAD, uh, an RCA angioplasty with thromboaspiration. And at that time, we discovered his LED was totally occluded. So we got him four months later, making sure that the RCS stent was doing well. This was the problem. We put in a wire across it and did an IVIS. And you can see the IVIS right on the, uh, on the right panel. And this is an IVIS which is cut right across. You know, the IVIS catheter would not pass beyond a certain point. And when it didn't point, uh, that's, that's the IVIS showing a 270 degree arc of calcium. This is typically, you may not see calcified lesions, you may not see them fluoroscopically, but sometimes the, the, when you start having difficulty putting, nudging balloons inside, when you have difficulty putting things into and intubating arteries and getting, you know, delivering low profile balloons, I think that's the time to think that you're gonna have difficulty putting in stents. Even if you are able to successfully dilate this artery, a calcified artery, even after you dilate this artery, it will give you suboptimal stent delivery. And Isam Musa reported that 8.2% of stent delivery failures in these patients where there was calcium and rotational arthrectomy was not used. So lesion bed preparation is the key to a point that even after you do a rotational arthrectomy, you need to make sure, and in my practice, I make sure that I go one is to one balloon dilatation, and instead of going with high pressure dilatations in these new thin strut stents, I then dilate the lesion, the novo, de novo lesion up to 18 to 20 atmospheres, making sure that I fully expanded a balloon in that artery before I even think about getting a stent into those arteries. And here's this patient, we put in a wire, we micro catheter, exchanged it for a rotor wire, um, a rotational arthrectomy. Uh, we actually then discovered, we actually studied the distal artery with the microcatheter, making sure that the distal bed was good and we don't have diffuse LED disease. Um, subsequently, a uh, rotational arthrectomy through the ostium of the LED into the uh, entire length of the LED. We spared the distal LED which had a lesion because that was an, an acute bend and that is exact. Can you see that acute bend right in that corner? Never do a rotational arthrectomy in distal arteries with such bends. You'll have perforations. So we stopped short of that. Um, uh, balloon dilatations and then um, final stent result. This patient is now seven months out, has got a negative thallium, and has got a great effort tolerance. Uh, Uh, this is a patient which is uh, the most recent. I tried to find the other three cases. I think uh, some of them were in the angio. Uh, I have angio films and videos which I can't retrieve somehow. 
but uh, this is the most easily, easy, easily found patient, uh, which was recent. Sengadu Valu, who is a friend of mine, invited me to do this patient. Um, this is a circumflex artery, which actually took off at right angles from an awkwardly taking off left main. And you find that uh, the, the index lesion is right here, um, and you can see that there's more lesion down. He attempted to put the stent into this artery, could not push it beyond a certain point. So he said, let me deploy it at that point. He de deployed, went up to 20 atmospheres. And can, I, I'm, I'm not sure if all of you can notice this really tight hourglass deployment of a stent at 20 atmospheres. It's partially deployed, a very small margin, uh, a small lumen through that. Um, there was nothing, no, no balloons would pass after that. So he gave it up and um, we discussed it. Now, how do you actually take care of this problem? I, I, we've, had, uh, we've had experience in this from around four patients now. What we do is, it's very important to, uh, we use rotational arthrectomy. The trick is to make sure that your wire has completely trans crossed the stent without kind of intertwining in the strut. So it has to be completely within the lumen of the stent. That's the first thing. And how do you do that? You make sure that you have soft wires, you go across, chase your microcatheter and make sure your microcatheter moves well inside. If your IVIS would allow you to do that, then take an IVIS and make sure that the struts of the strengths are around the wire and your wire is not trapped in one of those struts. Well, we didn't have IVIS on that particular day available to us. Um, this is the only situation where I do a reverse. That means I don't start with a small burr, I start with a large burr and then go to a small burr. I think the, the logic for this was beautifully explained by Sandeep in an earlier presentation, if any one of you actually listened to that presentation, where you get into a, when you start taking small burrs into undeployed stents, because of the struts of the stents, the shaft of the, the rotational atherectomy burr can get trapped and then you will not be able to pull it back. So the best thing to do is take a large burr and then basically take that stent and it, that large burr helps you widen the mouth of the proximal stent and then it gives you a better purchase into the lesion with a smaller burr. So we went with a 1.75 burr to start with. It wouldn't cross, we, it, it has to be extremely gentle, normal rotational atherectomy. You have runs of up to around 15 and 20 seconds. You would not do runs of more than five seconds or six seconds here because when that diamond burr hits and abrades on a metal little stent, the temperature raised in the coronary artery is immense and you've got to allow your blood flow to cool those arteries before you went to do anything else. And if not, you start getting no reflows in these arteries. So we use, normally, and this is also, we also break another rule of rotational arthritis in these patients, is we start, we normally take around burst speeds of around 180,000 to 200,000, uh, rather than the conventional teachings of 160,000 or 150,000. <laughs> Um, we've been able to successfully chase all those um, uh, lesions and uh, all four lesions have been successfully managed with uh, successful stent deployment subsequently. What if a lesion does not dilate after a rotational atherectomy? You've done a rotational atherectomy like the case over here. We have a bifurcation of Medina 011 calcified severely and densely. Um, there is a diagonal LED uh, junction. Um, we do a rotational atherectomy and the left upper panel into the diagonal branch and the lower panel into the LED. Uh, once you do that, um, you do a kissing balloon to make sure that your lesion is well prepared and at 20 atmospheres, the diagonal balloon would not yield. I think there are two ways to go. You can go up on the size of the burr. Here we went up on the size of the burr to 1.75, but it still wouldn't yield. So then, when you start using very large burrs in side branches, you increase the risk of perforation. So what I do is, if you cannot, if you've done what you can do with the rotational anthractomy, and if you still cannot, if the lesion doesn't yield, the best thing is not put a stent in there. I did a drug eluding balloon in the diagonal branch and put in a stent into the LED. The common scare is you've done a rotational atherectomy, I've done a balloon dilatation at 20 and is this artery going to abruptly close on me? Absolutely not, probably not. I shouldn't say absolutely not, probably not. The reason is because there's calcium all around and it's not loose soft tissue which is going to crumble and come into the lumen. It's all calcium which is not yielding. And these calcified lesions may re-stenose but they don't abruptly close somehow. 
And so it's safe to leave these patients without putting in stents because when you put in stents, you just make life very miserable for yourself. Half the times, the stents will not get into the position and if they do, you will have partially deployed them. So don't ever put in a stent if your balloon is not dilated in these situations. Now, um, and that is exactly what we did here. Sorry, I'm going back somehow. Um, and, and that is the result we accepted. Um, this patient is doing well. Uh, his uh, thalliums at six months are negative, but we hope to pursue him, and I'm hoping to get a repeat, a, a follow-up angiogram on him at the end of one year to be able to tell the complete story. So what do we do? Fibrotic calcified lesions can be resistant to dilatation to by balloon, plain old balloon angioplasty. Consider rotational arthritomy, modify the plaque, successfully conclude the case. Consider it early in the case, not when you get into trouble. And if still resistant, make sure you don't stent this artery. Rotational arthritomy is an effective tool to deal with um, underdeployed stents. We have been successful in the four cases that we've tried in the last four years. The trick is, the trick is to be gentle, to have much shorter runs. Never push in the bird. Do not have anything to do with force application in this case. Do not attempt it if the stent and the, and the feeding artery and the stent is at a right angle. Please do not attempt this because you're very likely to trap the burr. And um, if it ever happens, good luck. Thank you. Lado once in a year. And we learned a lot from you, as usual. Um, this once again, I want, I want to stress that the pre-delegation. Uh, till uh, last year, um, we used, routinely, I think most of us in the audience, uh, we, when pre -lateration, we used 2 into 10 or uh, 2.5 maximum, we, but when we came last year, we have a uh, very uh, almost calcified vessel, we went up even 3.5 NC baron up to 20, 24 ATM. Then he put the standard, uh, he, he insisted on adequately preparing the bed uh, so that the stent uh, deployment can be very easy. Uh, and we, uh, now we can